this this afternoon what we want to do is continue to look at the identity of the beast and um we should be going into revelation chapter 13 but as I, as i was looking over it i realized that there are still a few elements uh that we should have covered last week that we did not cover and so i want to just um do a quick revision my intention is that it should be quick sometimes it doesn't work out that way do a quick revision and then we are going to um go straight into chapter 13 and take it verse by verse but let me um let me first of all just use some illustrations to revise what we did last week Come, come, come. Okay. So last week we 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 saw that we looked at this beast that uh, John sees in Revelation 13. But what I try to point out and what I am still going to insist on is that you can't properly understand the beast of chapter 13 unless you understand the beast of chapter 17 that's that's one of the that's that's a key if you start with the beast of chapter 13 you're going to end up with some confusion that's why last week we went to chapter 17 and this week we're going to go to to, to chapter 17 again before we come back to 13 but um let's just what we saw is that this beast is a, is a reflection of the four beasts that Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7. These four beasts representing four great empires, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And we saw that there are elements of this. As you look at this beast, you see the same description to some extent. Or you see elements that point to these four beasts, showing that there's some connection. because the lion is connected to the mouth of this beast. The beast has a mouth of a lion. He has the feet of a bear. He has the body of a leopard. And God is showing us, this is not coincidence. God is showing us that this beast is a composite. This beast is a combination of all of those empires in one symbol. And why are we so sure about this? Because this beast has seven heads. And God shows us that these heads do not exist at the same time because in revelation 17 we saw where it says five have fallen let me see i have that somewhere yeah we see where it says five have fallen one two three four five have fallen meaning that and one is not yet come meaning that the beast has only one head because five are in the past and one is in the future so at this moment the beast has one head so why does god show the beast as having seven heads it's because he's showing us the beast in a panoramic view he's a panorama that embraces different ages that tells us that this beast is a composite representing all of these great empires that satan has worked through and we, we know that this is true also because we see that <clears throat> Satan, the dragon, is also represented as having seven heads. So we know Satan doesn't have seven heads. And we know nobody ever killed any of the heads of Satan. So God is showing us that what, it, what, what he's saying, I mean, the conclusion we draw is that Satan has had seven manifestations of his kingdom in the history of the world, seven. So we see Satan having seven heads because he has manifested himself through seven great heads. And we see the same thing reflected in the beast. The beast, as we said, is his baby. And the seven heads of the beast represent the seven manifestations of this satanic empire over the ages. Now, this should tell us that when you come to Revelation 13, we are looking at the beast at a particular point in time. Not in all ages, but at a particular point in time. It's very clear because 
when do we see this at least in Revelation 13? It is after the dragon has persecuted the woman and she flees into the wilderness and he puts he puts out water out of his mouth and the earth swallows the, the water and then the dragon goes to make war on the remnant of the woman's seed. And that is when we see the beast. But it's clear that this is the beast at this point in history. Because some of the heads obviously don't exist at this time. And one is still to come. So it's the beast at this point in history. It's not the beast in the seven periods of the seven heads. So what is important is we, we want to identify what point in time are we in the history of this beast? And that is where, um, you know, Revelation 17 comes in because Revelation 17 gives us a lot more detail about this beast. So we, we did suggest last week that these seven heads were, they represented the empires of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the European Union. Now I'm going to deal with the, I'm going to just comment a little further on the three that are here, which are often contended. <coughs> People object to, right? They say Egypt and Assyria, and some say the EU as well. And here's the reasoning. <clears throat> when you go to the book of, of Daniel, and, and of course, we say that Daniel is the foundation or the beginning of these prophecies in Daniel and Revelation. Daniel is a background from which you get the basis for Revelation. So they say when you go to the book of Daniel, you don't see God starting with Egypt or Assyria. God starts with Babylon. So why should you now in Revelation go back to Egypt when it's not mentioned previously in the prophecy? All right, that's a legitimate question and we'll come to it. Secondly, they will say, how do you get the EU at the end? Where does the EU come into it? The, e, the EU is not an empire. The EU is, is not a kingdom in the sense that the others are kingdoms. So we look at that as well. But, but, but let's, let me go back to Egypt and Assyria. <clears throat> it is true that in the book of Daniel, God starts with Babylon. However, when you go to Daniel chapter 11 and you go to Daniel chapter 8, God does not start with Babylon. If you remember the vision of Daniel chapter 8, it starts with a ram and a he goat. And the ram represents Medo Persia. And the goat represents Greece. Babylon is missing in Daniel chapter 8. So it's not true that the prophecies of Daniel begin with Babylon. Some of them begin with Medo Persia. And if you say, if you ask why, I will explain. The prophecies of Daniel, God starts where Daniel is at that point in time. It starts with Daniel's present situation. So in Daniel chapter eight, Babylon was about to pass. Babylon was about to pass. It had no more relevance in the, in, in the prophecy. And so God starts with Medo Persia. In Daniel chapter two and Daniel chapter seven, Babylon is still very much the greatest kingdom on the earth at that time. So God starts with Babylon. He does not go back to Assyria. He does not go back to Egypt because this is irrelevant to what God is trying to say in the book of Daniel. But when we come to the book of Revelation, in Revelation, God is giving us a complete history of Satan's work on this planet. This is why the dragon is represented as having seven heads. God is giving us the complete spectrum of Satan's attack upon the people of God. And to get that full picture, you have to go back beyond Babylon because that assault did not start with Babylon. It started long before. The first time after the flood, nations began to develop. Nations began to develop. One of the first nations was, was Babylon, the Assyria, Babylon Assyrian kingdom. It started at the Tower of Babel. Nimrod was the first person who began to assemble men into kingdoms and nations, into empires after the time of Babylon, of, of the flood. So it, it was sometime during this period that God called a set of people and made them also into a nation, into a kingdom, the children of Israel. And so God had a, had a people that he claimed as his own. And Satan consistently tried to use 
the nations of this world to destroy that kingdom. And he, he chose the greatest nations, the most powerful nations. He gave them his authority and his power. That's what the Bible says. The dragon gave the beast his authority and his power. And he used these nations in his efforts to destroy the people of God. You can look at, look, look at the history of the Bible and it's very clearly outlined. Because we know that just when Israel was a baby nation, there were, there were 70 people who went down into Egypt. The descendants of, of Jacob, they went down into Egypt, 70. And in 200 and something years, they had developed into a nation. And before they were even an independent nation, they were still living there in Egypt. The king of Egypt, Pharaoh, decided to wipe them out by ordering all the male children to be killed as soon as they were born. So that was the first, the first attempt by Satan to wipe out these people who were called God's people. Satan used the, the, the kingdom of Egypt, which, which was more than a kingdom. It, it was an empire. Egypt was a mighty nation that subjugated other nations. So Egypt was the first nation. And we know how they pursued the Israelites. And they, tried to, they wanted to slaughter them there at the Red Sea. But God prevented it. So Egypt was the first nation that Satan used in his effort to destroy God's people. Then Assyria. Some of us might not be aware that Assyria was made up, uh, um, that Israel, the people of Israel were divided into two nations. In the time of, of, of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, he treated the people badly. And so 10 of the tribes separated and they said, we don't want David's, we don't want David's sons to be ruling over us. So they, they pulled apart and they formed a different, different kingdom led by a man named Jeroboam, while three of the tribes, Judah and Benjamin and Levi, they remained with the, 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 the line of David. So you had two nations. The southern kingdom was the kingdom of the descendants of David, and it was called Judah. And the northern kingdom, they were the ones that broke away, and they were called Israel, and sometimes they were called Ephraim. Now, the, those 10 tribes, the Assyrians came against those 10 tribes and wiped them out, destroyed them, took them away as, as captives, and nobody knows where those 10 tribes are today. So that, that was a, a huge step in wiping out the nation of Israel. And then the other three tribes that were left, Babylon, um, um, Judah, and Benjamin, and Levi, they were taken captive by the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar came against them, wiped out half of the nation, carried away the rest into captivity, and emptied the land. Carried them away to, to, to Babylon. And they were there for 70 years as, as captives, right through until the time of Medo-Persia. In the time of Medo-Persia, because we know that the, the Persians were the ones that gave them the authority to go back home, the, the, the freedom to go back home. But before that, what we don't remember is that under Haman, Haman got the king of Medo-Persia to make a decree to destroy every single Jew. The people that were in the kingdom, they were supposed to take their swords and go and wipe them out on a certain date. The king made the decree. And that's what the book of Esther is about. The, 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 the prayers of Esther and Mordecai is what saved the Jews. God put Esther there for that purpose. So she was able to persuade the king to get the Jews to, he could not change, change his law. He made a law that the, the Jews were to be attacked at that date and he could not change it. In, in Medo Persia, once you made a law, once the king made a law, he could not change it. That's what they used against Daniel also when they put him in the lion's den. But what the king did instead, he made a, he, he, he made a second law. And this law was that the Jews could take swords and defend themselves. Remember, there were prisoners in Medo-Persia. But the king made a law now that they could get weapons and defend themselves. And that is how they were saved. As a matter of fact, they not only defended themselves, but they took the opportunity to go and, and slaughter many of these people that were against them. So it really turned around for their benefit instead of their um, destruction. And then in the time of, of the Greeks, in the time of the Maccabees, we don't have the Maccabees books in, in, in our version of the Bible, but the Maccabees are mostly books that talk about the history of the Jewish nation during that time of the Greek, Grecian Empire. And the Greeks, again, 
uh, under, under Antiochus Epiphanes. They, they tried to, to wipe out the nation of, of Israel. You had, that was the time when you had the Maccabees brothers, Judas Maccabeus and, and his brother, who made war against the Jews, against the Greeks, and defended Israel. So, so you can see how every one of these empires tried to destroy the people that were called God's people. And so it was Satan working through this beast empire, head after head after head after head after head, until you came down to the time of Rome. Now, the EU, why do we say the EU? It was a long time before I could come to, um, to, uh, to the agreement that we are talking about the European Union. You know, most Seventh-day Adventists and most, well, I wouldn't say most Christians, but many other Christians also, they believe, they, they would interpret it in this way. They would start at Babylon, but you, you, there are seven heads. So they would say Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, that's four. And then they would say the papacy, number five. And then they would say, what is it? The, 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 the deadly wound healed. I'm not sure what they would say for number six. But then they would say number seven, they say something like it's the United States or something like that. And, and those conclusions really, they don't make sense. They don't it's make pagan, sense. Pagan Roman paper room. Pagan Roman paper room, right. We, um, that would be five and that would be four and five. And I know they say um, where, where, where they go after that, I'm kind of a little bit, a, a little bit vague about it. So they have five, but there are two left. But I know that um, some of them suggest that number seven is the United States, which I will show you why it cannot be the United States. And, um, and we'll also look at why it cannot be papal Rome. But um, so, so these are the ones we come to. But let me just comment on the EU first of all. What we are looking at in head number seven is Rome that is not Rome. I've worded it carefully because that's exactly what we want to see. We want to see Rome. Why do we want to see Rome? Because according to the book of Daniel, the last kingdom is going to be Rome. According to the book of Daniel, there's no kingdom after, after Rome. Rome is to be destroyed and given to the burning flame. So we know it is Rome. And according to the book of Daniel, in chapter 2, it's Rome in a divided form. Remember, we have the legs of iron, and you have the feet of iron and clay. Rome is still there. The iron is there. But then there is clay, which shows you, as, 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 as God told Daniel, the kingdom shall be divided, and there shall be in it the strength of iron and the weakness of clay. That exactly is what we are looking at today. We are looking at the, 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 the divided. It's the same Roman Empire, but it is now divided, perfectly represented in the European Union, where there is an, an attempt at unity, but still a great deal of division and fracturing. So we have Rome. It has to be Rome, but it is still not quite Rome because it is it is it is divided. Yes, Brother Matt. I think for me, uh, it's more um, the principles of government that remain uh, from Rome rather than actually the uh, you know an emperor system. Um, a physical system of Rome. It's it's more like the judicial system is Roman. Uh, many of the aspects of Rome still remain in the dark circles. Our calendar, uh, you know, just things that people take for granted. They see every day. It's just they don't consider it to be Roman. Many of the customs and traditions we hold in regular, you know, in the East are are, are Roman. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I... And then initially Greek. Uh, really, it's. And then I think one important, one important factor is that the European Union is now under one system of government. This is something I, I never understood before until I was reading up on the reasons why England, why Britain came out of the EU. I actually saw somebody actually made a video on it and they were going into the details of why Britain came out. It's, 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 it's kind of ironic, but it's similar to why America, uh, it, the, the slogan in America when they broke away from Britain, one of the things they said was no taxation without representation. Britain was taxing them and yet they had no representation in the British Parliament and they felt it was unfair. And it's strange, but it's interesting that that, that is one of the reasons why Britain is pulling out of the European Union. 
they claim that they are being ruled by laws that are coming out of Belgium and they have no input into those laws and yet they are governed and controlled by these laws. And it, it's interesting because they say there, 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 I forget how many rules concerning toilet paper, how many rules concerning kitchen implements, little silly things, but, but the European Union is a huge bu bureaucracy that makes laws about every little detail of life. And so England is pulling out. But it's interesting that there is what it's, there's something equivalent to what you, you would call in America federal government. That's what the EU is. It's, it's like in America, you know, every state has its own little system of government to a certain extent. But federal government is an overruling government that controls the whole country. And in some cases, federal government will overrule local government in some cases otherwise. But it, it's one country with, with 50 different states. But in the EU, they are trying to, 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 to create a, a system similar, rebuilding Rome, but on a different principle, and this time without violent overthrow of, of nations. That's what they are trying to do. But the power of the EU, the financial power behind it, and the, um, the political power behind it, is what makes the EU a very strong force in the world today. And that is why we do see the EU as a major head of this beast. If you look, if you look at um, these seven institutions, oh, and I want to point out that the EU in this sense is a kind of empire because it has 28 nations under, under the umbrella of this one kingdom. And that's what an empire is. It's a, it's a, a kingdom, it's, an em, it's a, a great kingdom made up of many lesser kingdoms. That's what we call an empire. Now. The thing to point out here is that all of these nations that made up this beast, all of them were, were centered in what we call the old world, every one of them. If you even go by the, the four that we saw in the book of Daniel, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And though it says that the, these kingdoms would rule over the world, we know that what they ruled over was the old world. It was the world as it was then recognized, the civilized world as it was then known, as history records it. I mean, there were civilizations in China, India, and there, there were primitive tribes living, I suppose, in other parts of the world at this time, but they were, not, they, are not, they were not a part of the biblical world. And the biblical world is focused on Europe, the Middle East, and the North Africa. So these empires that we're looking at are empires that are centered in Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. That is the biblical world. And so this beast is a beast that belongs to the old world. It's important to remember that because the next beast that we are going to see is not belonging to the old world. So the Bible gives us this distinction between the beast from the old world and the beast from the new world. Now. This is a graphic that I, 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 I use, I want to use to, to, to make, make a point about the, the beast. We are going to come back to this when we come to Dan, um, the Revelation 17. But I might as well point it out here from now. What it says in Revelation 17 is that there are seven heads, five are fallen. Those are the ones in green. One is, that's the one in red. And the other is not yet come. That's the one in yellow. And the woman is sitting on the seven heads because it, it says, the seven heads which thou sawest where the woman sitteth. Brother Bro David, are you supposed to be sharing something? We're not seeing anything. I can see it. Yeah, brother. <laughs> yeah it is clear. We're seeing it. I'm seeing it. Oh, sorry. I was, I was, the, the screen was maximized. Sorry. Okay, okay. All right, and um, if, if you look, this, this diagram is a little strange because look at the end of it on the right, right corner and you'll see that uh, there are 10 spike things representing the 10 horns. And I've deliberately did this because I want to point out that these horns are not on any of the heads because that's exactly how the, 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 the prophecy describes it. It says, 
the ten horns which you saw are seven are ten kings which have received no power as yet. That's in the time of the redhead. They have received no power as yet, but they will receive power as kings one hour with the beast. But at the same time, when the beast becomes when the beast comes into power, these horns will receive their power. So these horns are ten end time powers that are very, very important because they are on the head of Satan. They, they, are, they are on Satan and they are here on the beast. They are significant entities. Now, why don't we put them on the head of any of the on any of the heads? It's because listen to what the prophecy says. It says, the beast that you saw, he is the eighth. The eighth what? He's not the eighth head. He's not a head. He is the eighth king. Because it says, we're going to look at this. I mean, I mean, I should have the Bible here, but I can't have both, both things up at the same time. So I'm quoting, and I'm hoping you're familiar with the, the, the verses. It says there are, there are five heads. These seven heads represent seven kings seven kings are seven kingdoms and it says the beast he is the eighth the beast is king number eight he's not one of the heads but he's king number eight and the ten horns will receive power for one hour with the beast so the rain is really pouring down so I hope the noise is not um is not coming through. All right. Hearing. All right. So the 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 what we have is the seven kings are the seven heads. Whatever these seven heads represent, they fall. And a new a new power, a new kingdom arises that cannot be identified with either Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo Persia. Greece or Rome. A new kingdom arises, and this kingdom has no recognizable head. Instead of having one recognizable head, this kingdom has ten, ten powers through which it manifests itself. And when 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 this kingdom arises, it is referred to as a beast from the bottomless pit. So the beast from the bottomless pit, when he arises from the bottomless pit, he will not have a head. Instead, he will have ten horns. But David, yes, brother Steve. But David, yeah. Um, the text says that the eight is of the seven. What yes. what does that refer to? What does that mean? Right. It's now, of the seven. Yes. So many people, most people interpret that to mean that the eighth is one of the seven, which is not what it says. I just point that out. I know you didn't say that. I just point that out because it mean it means that king number eight has been there during the existence of all seven heads. In other words, what has been the foundation of these seven heads? It has been the beast. So when the beast becomes king number eight, it's correct to say he was also a part of all the other seven. Brother David. So that's what I understand him to be sorry. saying, brother. We interrupted you, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, brother Matt, it's okay. And I was just thinking, you know, it hasn't materialized yet, but we know that uh, the world's governments are leaning towards a one world government, uh, right? Yes. A monarchy that hasn't really revealed its head yet. What are you going to do if that materializes to this prophecy? <laughs> uh, is it the eighth? No, I, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. Remember that this beast is an old world beast but there's another beast in the other part of the world which is equally as strong as this beast so whatever is represented in this beast is not a global power it's an old world power you can't leave america out of it you can't leave the second beast out of it that second beast is a huge factor and that second beast never disappears that second beast is there at the end when jesus is coming it's a beast and a false prophet who are there fighting against Christ at the end. So whatever is represented on this beast, it's not a global representation. It has to be something to do with the old world. But Brother David, you yes, said yes. earlier, a few minutes ago, you said that, and I agree with you, that 
the beast in Daniel. Rome is that beast in Daniel that, that is given to the burning flames. It continues right to the end. And that is the empire that rules over the entire, well, over the world as it was then, as yeah. it was seen. So how does that fit in with the second beast? Remember what the second beast does, right? The second beast gets everybody on earth to worship the first beast, remember? So even though the second beast is a major power and he, he, he is manipulating things, his ultimate aim is to focus worship on the first beast. So therefore, the, the, the focal element in this world is still the first beast. So when you look at Daniel 7 and you see that, it talks about these four beasts and the fourth one is given to the burning flame. It does not mention the two horned beast because that is not relevant to the prophecy in Daniel. What Daniel, what we're doing in Daniel is tracing the history of the, the European beast coming down, the European empires. And it shows you that the last empire is to be given to the burning flame. So, so God does not confuse the issue in Daniel by bringing in a power from the, another part of the world that never even existed or has no relevance to this prophecy. But in Revelation, he expands the picture and we see that there's more involved. Yeah, so I asked, <clears throat> sorry, I asked a question because I wanted to, you know, um, make sure that I'm focusing on radio, but by accepting that this beast is going to be the empire. That would yes. be yes. Yeah, this Brother, beast. Did... Yes, Sister what? Maria. Uh, who are who are the ten horns? Well, it, the Bible says that these are ten kings who have received no power as yet, and that's the the best I can say. I believe there are ten. I don't know if 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 this ten is ten nations in Europe that that will that will take over the entire the entire entire European Union. I I really don't have a clear answer. What I know is that it says that these ten horns are going to hit the prostitute, the whore, and they are going to eat her flesh, make her naked, and burn her with fire. They are the powers through which the beast will manifest his power. The beast will work through these ten horns. So I imagine that there are ten entities that will arise in Europe, whether, whether they, they, they will have be ten, ten heads of government or ten nations that will dominate the others, or whether the ten is even... Well, I was going to say the 10 might be a figurative number, but I'm going to take that back because I don't think so. The seven heads are, are literal, I believe. So I would think that the 10 horns are also literal. But um, I would say there are 10, 10 powers that arise in Europe or 10 divisions that will come about. But other than that, it, it, it's very difficult to say, say yet because these have not yet been manifested. All right, so. Brother David. Yes, brother, brother IIA. Yeah, you just said that the beast is not a, a global power. But the Bible said that all the world wandered after the beast. Yes. Um, and the reason why I say this is because, remember, I just pointed out um, that the second beast is, is, the, is the power, he exercises all the power of the first beast. And he gets the world and those who dwell in it, the earth and those who dwell in it, to worship the first beast. So who compels the world to worship the first beast in our part of the world? It's not the beast. It's the second beast. It's a false prophet. But this is why I say the beast is not a global power, because he, he clearly is not, the, he is not the power in this part of the world. But he has, an, he has a friend over here. And this friend over here gets everybody to worship the beast. That's why I say it's not a global power. Well, still, I don't understand. Well, maybe get everybody in the new world to worship the beast. But like in the old world and in Africa and everywhere else, who get the power to, who, who convince them to worship the beast? Yes, I think, I, think, I think in the old world, it's clear that the beast is a dominant power. You see, but, but then the Bible gives us, it says there's another beast that comes up out of the earth and he exercises all the power of the first beast. And then it goes on to emphasize what the second beast does. And clearly he's exercising a great deal of power and authority, but he's exercising it 
in getting everybody to turn their attention to the first beast. So yes, it is true that he is a false prophet. He is working on behalf of this, the, the, the first beast. But my point is that the first beast does not have the, 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 the power or the authority to do it in this part of the world. So he is depending on his friend or his prophet to do it on his behalf. So yes, there is global worship of the beast, but it is not because of the beast direct exercise of his own power. It's because of his friend, the false prophet. So that's what I mean when I say the beast is not a global power. All right. Um, we already looked at this, but I just want to point out um, one or two little things here. Um, the, the, in, in all of these prophecies, chapter 7, chapter 13, and the dragon in chapter 12, there, there are similarities. The dragon has seven heads. The beast in 13 has seven heads. The beast in 17 has seven heads. All of them have 10 horns. But you also see that um, there's a difference in, um, in the way the crowns are described. The dragon, Satan, has seven crowns on his seven heads. The beast in chapter 13 has 10 crowns on his 10 horns. And the beast in chapter 17, there's no mention of crowns either on the heads or on the horns. So if you ask me, how is this, what, what does this mean? Well, why does Satan have seven crowns on his seven heads? Like I said, Satan's rule on this planet has been divided up among seven great empires. So Satan, these seven empires have been Satan, Satan, Satan's kingdoms. So he has seven crowns representing his seven kingdoms. But when you come to the beast, the beast has seven heads and ten horns. But the beast, the beast empire, the beast reign is not focused on, on, on the heads. The, 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 the crowning moment of the beast, that we are, when we're looking at the beast, we're looking at the beast at a certain point in time. And the point in time we're looking at the beast, he does not have seven heads. He only has, as we have seen, he only has one head. So we're actually looking at the beast down at the end of time when the ten, 10 horns will receive their power. They receive power one hour with the beast. And that is why they are, they are represented as having 10 crowns because they, they receive their power at that time. The crowns representing the receiving of this power. So that's my, my, my comment. You look at the beast at another time and he doesn't have the crowns. It's because at that point, you're not seeing the beast during this period of the ten horns. So that's my suggestion where the crowns are concerned. Another idea that I would like to um, comment on is the question, can the beast represent Satan himself? Because some people say, all right, you have the seven heads, and then the beast comes from the bottom, let's be, they say it is Satan himself, because of course there is the belief that Satan is going to appear on this earth, and he's going to appear on this earth as an angel or as Christ himself, and so they say this beast is Satan himself. But I don't agree with that either. And there's a verse that, that gives me some foundation for my belief. In Revelation 16 and verse 13, it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. God shows the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet as three distinct and separate entities. You can't make them the same. You can't make the beast into the, the, the dragon at one time and the dragon into the beast sometimes. It can't work because God makes them distinct and separate. The dragon gives his power to the beast, but he's not the beast. That's why in Revelation 12, when they say that the dragon is Rome, I, I, I object completely. I, I, I completely object to that. The dragon is not Rome. God says the dragon is Satan. Rome is the dragon's servant. It's the dragon's agent, but it's not Satan. It's not the dragon. Don't confuse them. I am very, very much opposed to that idea. Why can't the beast be the papacy? All right, this is the million dollar question. This is the question that um, has caused the greatest opposition to what I have been trying to say. Uh, brother David. Yes, Brother uh, Julius. Why is it... Uh... Why is it that these uh, three unclean spirits are coming from these three uh, in the beast and the dragon, as well as the first?
Um, okay, I'm going to give a, a quick answer, but I, I promise when we come to Revelation 15, Revelation 16, we are going to look at it in more detail. But three unclean spirits, exactly what these are, as I said, we, we, we won't look into it in detail, but it, it's clear that there is a spirit of evil, there is a spirit of deception that is focused on these three great elements. Some suggest that say, the dragon here represents the working of spiritualism, and it may be, but what God is telling us is that the influence of Satan and the work of the beast and the false prophet is, is creating deception on the world that will cause people to fall under the influence of, of, of these anti-God powers. But to look at it in detail, I'm going to wait until we actually come to the chapter because it will require some, taking some time to really examine it closely and in depth. I, I think that's our brother Sam. Uh, Wing is on brother David. Okay. Uh, yes. Go ahead, brother Sam. I uh, now it makes sense. Uh, I I understand. I understand. Okay, brother Judy. All right, so why can't the beast be the papacy? This is one of the most sacred beliefs, especially in, in, in like among Adventists, that the beast is a papacy. As a matter of fact, right now, you can go, you can go to any forum and you can go to many forums on Facebook. You can go all over YouTube and you'll find dozens of messages focusing on the papacy being the beast. And you could almost set up a, a, what is called a Pope watch, and you can see hundreds of statements every single day focused on this particular issue. So it, it, it's, it's really a massive thing when anybody comes out and says that the beast is not the papacy. And, and, and we just look at this question here now. <clears throat> now, here are, here are the two fundamental points. Brother Sean had asked me to um, put together a little chart pointing out some of these symbols in prophecy and what they mean. And I should have done it and I didn't do it, but I, I promise I'll get around to it, Brother Sean. But in the prophecy, this is a fo foundational thing. Churches are represented as women. I don't think anybody here would disagree with that. Churches or religious bo bodies are represented as women. In Revelation 12, God's church is represented as a, as a woman, a pregnant woman, clothed with the sun and having the moon under her feet. And the false, the great false religious system is represented as a prostitute woman. And this is, this, is an, this is a symbolism that goes back to the Old Testament. In Jeremiah 6, I believe it is, and I think it's verse 2. I could be wrong, but I think it's Jeremiah 6 and verse 2. God says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. God says, I've compared my people to a beautiful woman. So it's a universal symbol. The idea of prostitution is always associated with an apostate a religious group. In, 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 in Ezekiel, several places in the Old Testament, God refers to Israel as a harlot, as a prostitute, because she has prostituted herself, sold herself to the nations around instead of being faithful to God. So it's, it's a symbol that is so strongly expressed in the Bible that we don't really have any real question about it. A religious body is represented as a woman. And now along with it goes the reality in all of these prophecies, Daniel and Revelation, an empire is represented as a beast. And God tells Daniel very clearly, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, no, God told Daniel, the angel told Daniel that the, the, the four beasts in Daniel 7 are four kings that would arise out of the earth. And just in case we think these mean individual people, in verse 23 of the same chapter, he says, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom so god tells us clearly that a beast represents a kingdom 
Now, you don't have any overlapping of these symbols. And it's very clear. Let me see if I have this. It's very clear because you see that we, we, we saw this at the beginning, I think. Let me go back. Oh, right here we have it. It's very clear because in Revelation 17, what do we have? We have a woman riding on the beast. You have the two symbols there in one. You have, you have a woman representing the religious body and you have the beast representing the political empire. And God shows them as two different entities. They are not one. The beast is one and the woman is another. And just in case we are confused and we, we, we still think they are the same, God shows us, God settles the question decisively because he says the ten horns which you saw upon the beast these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire just in case you think that a woman is a part of the beast god makes it clear this is not so that the, the beast through the ten horns actually makes the whore naked eats her flesh and burns her with fire. The, the, the beast does not destroy itself. The beast does not destroy a part of itself. The woman does not destroy herself. There are two different things. But what we see is that they are in a romantic relationship, if you can call it that. They are in an adulterous relationship. Two things are mingling that don't have any right to be mingling. And so she, she has a great deal of influence over the beast. She's manipulating the beast, if you, if you wish. Or maybe the beast is humoring her. Because at the end, what the beast does is he turns against this woman and he destroys the woman. So this is what the Bible says. And if, you put, if we put all the passages together, it is abundantly clear this woman cannot be the beast. The beast cannot be the woman. Therefore, the, the, the beast cannot be the papacy because the papacy is primarily the Roman Catholic Church institution. It's primarily, primarily a church institution, even though it has some political power. So you can't say that the beast is a papacy. What you would say is that the political part of the Roman Catholic Church destroys the religious part of the Roman Catholic Church. That does not make any sense. Yes, Sister Diane. It made me think that with the woman riding the beast, like you said, she can manipulate. And when you're riding an animal, you, even though you might not have full control, but you have some control over the animal, uh, where it goes, how it goes. That's why you're riding it. You've got some kind of control to it. So then it reminded me of the issue with with France. The the the, the French were. A, a, a nation, a, a, a horn, I guess, that she was riding at that time, just for illustration. And it turned against her and devoured her and kind of not totally destroyed her, but symbolically kind of destroyed her. So it made me think of that. It, 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 the French Revolution is a, is, a, is a graphic illustration of what we will see in the last days. It was, a, it was a graphic type. Almost all the elements are there. Um, so th there's something that you, you said that reminds me of something I should say, which is this. It's, it's very important to remember that the woman is riding the beast. So this is one of the things that confuses people because we see the woman pulling the strings and manipulating and, and, and imposing her will. And so people are focused on the woman and they say, they said the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church, they are all fixated on the Catholic Church and they are convinced that the Catholic Church is a great agency in the last great persecution. But this is because the Catholic Church up to this point is manipulating and not just the Catholic Church, not just the Catholic Church, but false religious systems, false Christian systems, they, they have joined in and they are imposing their power both in the old world and in the new world. Without They're taking, imposing their influence to gain power. Absolutely. And without taking political sides, it, it, it's very evident to anybody who is watching the, what is going on in America and who is not politically blinded that the political, the, the, the religious 
the, the, the kingdom theology people in America are very much focused on taking control or, or having a great influence on how the country is run. It's one of the reasons why they are, they are so, so much behind Donald Trump. You know, I'm leaving the issues out of it because it's not my business and I'm not, I don't want any politics to get into our discussion. But it's clear to me that these, these religious people, they have an agenda and they are manipulating Donald Trump to fulfill their agenda. And I think both sides are evil. So just make no mistake about it that I am not pushing anything at all. But, but that is clear. And that is what the, the prophecy shows us. The woman is riding the beast. So but it is true. Uh, just a second. Yeah. It is true that the woman needs to be, we need to keep an eye upon the religious powers, upon the papacy, upon the Protestant churches, because the woman is riding the beast. But the problem is when we go on to conclude that the woman is the beast. That's the problem. Yes, Ann, go ahead. I, I just wanted to point out that Howard made a very um, important point earlier in this study this morning, that all of the Protestant churches, almost all of them have now said that there's no difference between themselves and the papacy. They have made themselves into one, basically. And that means that this woman represents not just the papacy, but all Protestantism, or former Protestants coming back together under one umbrella. Yes, and, and, and when we go to Revelation 17, we will see that once we understand what Babylon is, it's not just a Catholic church at all, not just a Catholic church. If I may make a quick point, Brother David. Yes, Brother Hall, go ahead. Well, it's interesting the wording of Revelation 17 because it never says that the the, the woman which rides the beast. It actually says, I'll show you the mystery of the, the woman and the beast which carrieth her. So there seems to be a difference in the wording. It's not so much that the woman is in control. It is showing what carries woman as if the beast allows this woman to be there until her time expires. So there's a difference. If you look at the wording, it says the beast which carried her. But I guess you look at that in chapter 17. But well, just, 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 just to keep that note in mind, that is the beast which carried her and not the beast which she rides means that she's in control yes all right that's a good point because the bible does focus on the beast as a key agent of satan but i mean uh, what we what we see is that there is a relationship an adulterous relationship where they are benefiting each other you know so while he carries a woman i'm sure that she's benefiting she's benefiting and he's benefiting you know um, i don't know oh, i'm sorry David. Go ahead, um, yes. I, I don't know how uh, it's to be represented, but I know that a religion is playing a huge role in, in, the, in the direction that things are going. Last month at the Washington Mall in America, they held a prayer meeting in the morning with religious leaders, uh, I think internationally. Um, this was an international event, and they had this uh, messianic, I think Khan is his last name, uh, as the leader, and he was just conducting this whole event in, in in like a messianic, like a Jewish, with a Jewish theme. And it wasn't even real Judaism because Jews don't really recognize him as being Jewish because they don't believe in Jesus, um, but he does. And uh, it's, it was just unbelievable the direction that it went. Um, so, so unbiblical and uh, manipulative and uh, lots of chauffeur blowing, and, uh, misinterpretation of, you know, prophecy. And, and uh, it, 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 it's playing a huge role. And I don't, I don't see how it can be left out of the equation. And maybe you're not. You're just not including it as one of the leaders, you know, one of the empires. Well, not empire, but maybe horns or, I don't know. It, but it plays a huge role. And in Catholicism, I believe, is in, in, in this global, you know, the Pope being on top of global warming and, um, you know, Sunday family worship and just Sunday togetherness and promoting Sunday in his encyclical and, all these, I mean, pick one. If you're not part of the religious, you could be for the earth. And if you're not part of the earth, you could be for family. And if you're not, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Is there's something that people can hold on to? That the, 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 the religious bodies, the churches are being... Uh, Brother David. Yes, Brother Joseph, just a minute. 
the, the churches are uh, being, I don't think you're here, Brother Joseph, can you hear? Um, Brother David, in my own opinion, my humble opinion, I was thinking that, I'm thinking that the reason why the woman in Revelation chapter 17 will be killed by the beast, it's because the beast wants to be alone and the beast wants to accomplish its mission alone. I don't know if it, that makes sense to you, but in my own humble opinion, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. Um, yes, the, 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 the beast has an agenda and the woman has an agenda. But you know, in, in my opinion, when you look at what is happening, I believe that one of the most dangerous elements today is the evangelicals, is the evangelicals in America. They, they, they have an agenda. Um, some time ago, we discussed what we call kingdom theology. It is this idea that God is to use them to set up a kingdom on earth. And, and we know how whenever, whenever religious powers have obtained political power, we know it has been one of the most dangerous times for the true people of God. And that is what these people are against, as Brother, as brother Matt describes what, what was happening. That is what these people are against. They, 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 don't, they don't focus on, they don't understand the Bible and they don't understand biblical principles, but they are determined to set up their concept of the kingdom of God where they are in control. And unfortunately, many of these people see that in the present presidential race in America, it's a, it's a, con, it's a contest between God's chosen one and Satan's chosen, and they choose to take a side. And, and, and so I, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing Sister Merle. And so they get involved. Oh. In, I, I hear you, Sister Merle, just a minute. And so they get involved in something where no Christian has any business to be involved. It's, 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 it's a contention for what the Bible calls the false prophet or the second beast. And what, what, what business does a Christian have to be involved there? Go ahead, Sister Merle. If you don't mind, Brother um, David, can you please uh, re-explain Revelation 17, verse 16 for me, please? 1716. All right, let me put it on the yes, screen. Thank you. All right. Revelation 17 and verse 16 says, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, ye shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. What I understand this to be is that, okay, we know that in many of these verses, the Bible is using figurative language. So I don't believe this means that they are going to cannibalize the people in the churches. Babylon does not really have real flesh. And Babylon is made up of many different religious bodies. They're not going to go and burn down every church, but it's, it's figurative language. And what it means is that if you look at Revelation 18, all right, some people who do not read with discrimination. They are convinced that in Revelation 18, it's, it's some literal city that is being burned. Well, let me not say people who don't have discrimination. Some people just have that idea, all right? But if you notice, um, it says, she shall be utterly burned with fire. Speaking of Babylon, it says the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. So it kind of presents the idea that there's a place that is burning and people look and they see the burning and they start to wail. It says they are standing afar off. Does it mean that people are literally standing on a place and they are looking and seeing this place burning and all the kings come and they gather at this one place and then they are looking at this and they are, they are mourning and wailing and 
it goes on to say, the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her, and the merchandise of gold, silver, and precious stones. I mean, for, as far as I'm concerned, here is God giving you a graphic description of the, the, the overthrow of false religion. What I take it to mean, this is my own understanding of it, okay? My understanding is that the, the secular powers that represent the beast, the secular powers, what they are going to do is exactly what they did during the time of the French Revolution. Sister Diane mentioned it already. During the French Revolution, they literally slaughtered many of the Catholic Church. Many of them were killed, but the, the major thing that I want to focus on is that they took away all the property from the church. They secularized the churches. They, they made the religion illegal. They made religious services illegal, and they created a completely secular society. And they did everything in their power to wipe out religion. When I look at what is happening today, I think this is what is going to happen. I think that um, the powers of Europe, and I think it will be it will be also mirrored in America, that these churches that have become so rich with their great cathedrals and they've had this great political influence and power, I believe the, the, the political powers of the world, the secular powers, are going to turn against the, these religious bodies. They are going to strip them. Well, you, you have seen already that um, in the time of, um, was it Lyndon Johnson? He took away one of... Brother David, that, can I ask you? Yes, Brother Kevin. Well, let me just finish the sentence, right? There, there, was, there was something that Lyndon Johnson took away from the, 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 the churches where if you speak up on political issues, your tax-exempt status will be taken from you. And I think, I think Donald Trump has replaced that. But what I mean is there are certain privileges that religious bodies have. And I believe these are going to be taken away. Right now, you see the hatred. The secular forces are building up and they are hating uh, anything to do with Christianity, religion, but especially Christianity. And they want these privileges to be taken away. And it's being helped by the fact that many of these pastors are thieves and scoundrels. And they are, they are raping the people. And so the, the tide is changing. And what we see is Let's that they... The secular powers will eventually turn against these people and completely wipe out these churches. Go ahead, Kev. Um, Brother Dave. Sister Beth has a question um, that she wanted, she was requesting someone to read it, so I'll just, I'm just going to ask it for her. Um, it's, if the whore mystery Babylon, the great city, is already hated and burned by the ten kings by the time of the sixth plague, trumpet how can she still be an object of mourning and great sorrow by the same kings of the earth after the seventh plague plus how can her staple system described in revelation 13 still be around at the coming of christ in revelation 19 to be cast into the lake of fire separately from the dragon give me give me that last statement the last sentence um plus how can her staple system described in revelation 13 They'll be around staple. at the coming. Staple system. Yeah, staple. Is yeah, staple system. All right, I think I know Still what you mean. Okay, all right. All right. Um, uh, there was somebody else who wanted to say something. I, I'm going to get to you in just a moment. But uh, this is what Sister Beth, Beth is um focusing on. It says um in verse 19 of Revelation 16. And the great city was divided. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now I could explain this in two ways. Number one, when is the woman, when is the woman destroyed by the beast? When is the woman looted and raped? Is it at the same time that, that we, are, we are looking at here where it says that great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath? Is this the same event at the same time? Or is it? Here's another explanation. And both of these are, are ideas that I believe have, have merit. When it says that the, the, the ten horns 
I'm sorry, I have to mute everybody because there are some funny sounds coming in. You can unmute yourself if you have to say something. Okay, when the time comes. Um, when the Bible says that the, the, the ten horns hate the whore, eat her flesh, make her naked, and burn her with fire. Does it mean that, the, that Babylon is completely destroyed, or does it mean that Babylon has been raped and looted and devastated? It does not say she's destroyed, even though it says she's burned with fire. You get the picture of, 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 of Babylon, be, Babylon being buttered by the ten horns. But as, as Beth points out, if you go to Revelation 16 here, the sixth plague, or is it the seventh plague? The seventh plague. It says, Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So Babylon has been completely devastated. But it seems that there is still a remnant left or it's not completely wiped out. So there is still something left that is to receive the wrath of God. Okay, that, that's, that's how I would explain this. But if you look at um, Revelation 19, she asked the question, how is Babylon's staple? Her words, how is it that it remains to be destroyed at the coming of Christ? And I know what she's talking about. She's talking about the false prophet. The beast was taken and with him the false prophet. Because many believe that this false prophet is Babylon. I don't agree with that. So that's a question that um, probably is not, is not is, it doesn't apply to how I see the prophecy. I don't believe that this false prophet is Babylon, is Babylon. I believe that this false prophet is the false prophet. Babylon is not the false prophet. Babylon is the woman that is riding this beast. The false prophet is not riding the beast. The false prophet is a friend of the beast. But the woman Babylon is riding the beast. So it's three different entities. The woman is devastated and she's subjugated and she's burned. And then finally God's judgment comes upon her and at the seventh plague. But that's different from the beast and the false prophet. All right? And, yes, Sister Diane. And part of her question, I don't know if this is it, but a part of their wailing for her for so long, she asked about the time of them grieving over her, wailing over her, it's because the merchants of this earth have waxed uh, so strong with her delicacy. So if you think about the 1% who own and operate everything in this world and they lose it, they're not going to just walk away and for a minute being happy that this is done. They're going to uh, lament this for a very long time during this time period, I think. Yes. Um, having a little problem with my screen here. Hmm. Okay. Right. So, so. I noticed that we, 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 we haven't even got to Revelation 13, and it's clear that we, this evening we're not going to go into it in detail. But I think this is the last time we're going to be going back and forth like this, because I, I, I believe it's very important that we, we see these elements, because when you come to chapter 13, we're going to fall into this well-established idea that the beast we're dealing with is the papacy. We're going to hit upon this when you come to Revelation 13. So. It's very important that, uh, that, that, that before we go there, we should look carefully at all the reasons why I can't take, we can't take. I don't, I, I don't say, want to say we because I'm not speaking for everybody. Maybe I'm speaking for most of us, but I can't take this position that the beast and the papacy are the same. I can't because you can't take Revelation 13 in isolation. You have to look at what it also says in chapter 17. It's the full spectrum of all the information that we have that we bring to bear on the issue. It's very, very attractive. It's very, very tempting to say that the beast is the papacy because when you go and make the connection with, with Daniel 7, there are so many similarities. 
But as we go into the, the, the chapter in detail, we will see how we can explain those similarities. But first of all, I wanted us to understand why we cannot say that the beast and the papacy are one and the same. The papacy is either involved with the woman, and I, I wouldn't even say either. It can't be the beast because the beast is a secular power. It is never a religious power. And the papacy is a religious power. One of the appeals of the papacy is that it is the only religious kingdom in Christendom, not in the world, because you have you have you have Islamic religious kingdoms. But in Christendom, the only religious kingdom, the only religious power that is a is a political power is the papacy. But it is religious. So uh, anyway. really, Sister Janet had wanted to ask a question. Okay, uh, go ahead, Sister Janet. Yes, you were talking about that amendment, uh, the Johnson Amendment, and it was passed in 1954 that prohibited our 501c and three nonprofit organizations from endorsing or opposing political candidates. So that's that's the amendment that Donald Trump, I think, he he uh, pulled down, and you can see why he pulled it down because of what it was saying. So if you, the churches came up under this 501C. I, yes, I can, I can very much see. I mean, you know, you know, America is, is a challenge. It's a challenge and it's, it's for all Christians, it's, it's something that we really should examine very carefully. The reason being that I'm one of those people who, a lot of the things that the Democrats stand for, I completely oppose them. Like abortion, like like homosexual marriage, like, I mean, it, it seems like in a lot of ways, the Democratic Party is completely set on eroding all, all the influence of, of Christianity. It seems that way. And it's a challenge because you know that one of the principles that America has stood for that we, 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 we have always trumpeted and, 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 and applauded is the freedom for people to follow their conscience, worship Satan if you want to. It's appalling to me that there is, there is a group in America called the First Church of Satan. But then I ask myself, what is the right thing to do? If you have freedom, shouldn't you be free to worship Satan if you want? And some part of it sounds so offensive, so abhorrent to me. Something wants to say no, but then you have you, you you are like caught between the rock and the hard place because you say if you forbid these people from worshiping, what if somebody comes into power who is against Christianity? Doesn't he have the right to do the same thing? To forbid you from worshiping. So it's a two-edged sword, and it's very challenging because you can see playing out before our eyes. On the other hand, you have these people who are determined to make America into a religious kingdom. They seem to believe that America is a modern day kind of Israel. And they're applying how God dealt with ancient Israel to how they see God dealing with America today. And they want to turn America into this theocracy, it seems. And they are doing everything in their power. But they're also standing for those things, some of those things that I believe in. They're also against abortion. They're also against the homosexual thing. And so it's like you're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. You can't support this side and you can't support that side. And maybe that really should be the bottom line that Christians should say, what on earth am I doing involved in this thing? You know, let me preach the gospel. And I really believe that that is the best place to be because it really is painful when I see, when I see Christians take one side, it bothers me. And when I see them take the other side, it bothers me. because. There is so much evil associated with both sides. So anyway, what we see happening in America and in the world, though, according to the prophecy, is a situation where the woman rides the beast. So the, the, and, and this woman that is riding the beast is not God's people. This woman that is in some kind of relationship with the secular power is not God's people. It's a prostitute. 
And that tells us clearly that anywhere we find, anywhere in this world, these religious bodies getting into bed with these political powers, these are not God's people. These are not God's institution. And the, 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 the end of the story, we know how it's going to be. Their, 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 their lover is going to turn against them and destroy them. But I'm going to stop here this evening and just leave the, the room open now for any questions or further comments that anybody might have. Uh, David? Yes, Brother Ayani. Said... Where do you place Second Thessalonians 2 in Revelation? Second Thessalonians 2 talks about the man of sin, I'm pretty sure. All right, it says in verse 3, it says there will come a falling away and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, this is a, a strong reflection of what we see in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 11, when he talks about the king of the north, and in Daniel chapter 7, when he talks about the, the little horn, these words are very, very expressive. They point us in that direction. So I believe, I very much believe that the little horn in Daniel 7 represents the papacy. The papacy is one of those horns that uproot, it's the horn that uprooted three of those political powers and exalted itself right down until about 1798. I am perfectly in harmony with this. But I believe Revelation is, is referring to the last moments of time. And I think what people have done, what people are doing is taking the historical reality and imposing it on the last day reality. Now, Paul said that before Jesus comes again, the man of sin would have to appear. And I believe this refers to the Pope. And he, 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 he sat in the temple of God. He sat in the Christian church showing himself that he's God. I believe that this was fulfilled and has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled by the Pope. So I don't have a problem with this. But I still don't believe that this makes the Pope into the beast. The beast is a secular entity. Yeah, but he, he, when we continue the reading, he says that the Lord will destroy him at his coming. I agree. I agree. I don't think the Pope is going to survive the coming of the Lord. <laughs> My question, Brother David, is uh, relating to Sister Beth's question. I don't understand. Um, it, it, the, where where do we where did where did we come to the conclusion that the Babylon is being mourned for after the seventh plague is is poured out? Um. After the seventh plague, all right. Um, that's a good question because I didn't um, focus on that part. Yeah, what it says is um. Yeah, Her question. She said, "If the whore of Mr. Babylon, the great city, is already hated and burnt by the Ken kings by the time of the sixth plague slash trumpet, how can she still be an object of mourning, mourning and great sorrow by the same kings?" of the earth after the seventh plague yes uh, yes so your question is quite you're quite right there's no no place that says babylon is being mourned for after plague number six so that must have been a misconception on the part of sister beth okay all right um is there any any other point or question anybody Sister Diane. Brother Clayton. I heard I, a, um, uh, just a second, Sister Lorena. Sister Diane first. I heard a, a popular pastor the other day, somebody sent me a tape and I couldn't finish it because he started off by saying he was dealing with Revelation and he was given the de description of Revelation 13, what those faces were of this beast. And he made a point that when John was writing, Rome was in control. So if Rome was in control when John was writing, 
this description, he can he went on to say in a little bit, and this now is the papacy. He just changed it over. But in the when his when he was given the breakdown of the what those the mouth of the lion, this is Babylon, and the Roman Empire was in existence at the time John is writing. But now as he goes to explain the rest of the chapter, he just says this is the papacy. And I couldn't deal with that because he just interjected it's the papacy and went forward. And I was like, well, why would you just say that the, the that Rome was in control, not papal Rome, Roman Empire is in control when John is writing and just flip it that it's now the papacy. That's, you know, it just, I couldn't even go any further, even though somebody sent it to me and said, oh, this is a good study, but I couldn't even go any further. <laughs> it happens all the time, Sister Diane. I see all over those inconsistencies just jump all over the place. I, I don't like, um, I don't like cliches, but you know, the, the theologians talk about eisegesis and exegesis. And when you understand it, it, it makes sense, even though I don't like to, um, to try to, to use those kind of terminologies. But there, there are people who go to the Bible and their intention is to find support for what I do. That's it. They, 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 there are few people who go and say, let me listen. And it's understandable because you can't. Because you belong to a system and it has been drummed in your head that these are inspired interpretations. You cannot think outside of that box. You must, you must bend everything to make it say what you have been told that it believes. That, that, that it means, you know, so I understand exactly what you're saying. I, I remember having a discussion with somebody on Facebook and we were talking about the beast and he was, he was so happy and he was going with me step by step and he was agreeing with me everything. And all of a sudden it dawned on him that if this is true, the woman cannot be the people, the beast cannot be the papacy. And he stopped, it was two of them and he just stopped and he's like, it, he just brought a wall between us and he just stopped the conversation. He would not go any further. He, he, he and his friend were, were so happy where we were going and they were saying, yes, it makes sense. And at that point, as soon as I recognized that, bang, they just closed the door. And that's very disappointing to me because you, you can't teach the Bible. You have to allow the Bible to teach you. Sister okay. Lorena. Yes, Sister Lorena, go ahead. Yes, I, I'm, there are several characters in chapter 13, um, and I just want to un understand uh, what they represent. You, we have the beast, um, which represents who or what? And, uh, the beast, um, represents, the beast represents Satan's kingdom in this world. Not necessarily Satan. No, no, it's absolutely not Satan. Satan is a dragon. Yes. And now the woman riding the beast does the false churches, including yes. the papacy. Yes. yes, absolutely. And then you have the false prophet. Which is the United States of America, or the, 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 the power that exists in the America, in America. Okay. Um, all right, so I got it. So I now I can understand verse two of chapter 13, which says that the dragon gave the beast power. Yes. And in a great authority. Absolutely. Okay. Now, this Satan's kingdom is not necessarily in one location. This is, how do you? Satan's where was because, it, I just want to understand where this kingdom is located and, or where is it being manifested now? Right. The, the, the great center has been historically in the old world, Europe, North Africa, and the East. That has been the, the center of Satan's, because that's where God's people were. For most of, of, of the history of the world, God's people were in that part of the world. And so Satan developed his greatest enemies of God's people in that part of the world. That's natural. Today, we live in a global, a global world, and so God's people are scattered everywhere. And so it won't do for Satan to just attack them in that part of the world. And so he has raised up another power, which is, which is 
America, he has raised up another power in this side of the world now to assist in carrying out his assault upon God's people. So, mm -hmm. so the beast has been, the first beast has been located in the old world mm -hmm. through, through these seven different nations or these, these seven great nations, seven great empires. And as we pointed out, there were Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, and now the EU. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome, Sister Lorena, and thanks for the question. All right. If there is no other question, we will officially close the meeting and then we will still be open for discussion for those who want to talk. All right. So let's give thanks.